Hey guys, uh, welcome to our online talk with um, this is me, Sini, and Ivona. Hi, Ivona. Hi. <laughs> um, it's our. Uh, we're very sad that um, we have to cancel all the on-site on activities so that um, this we have to record this talk, which is a long talk around one hour. And we have a guest here, Perrin Fountain. He is an expert in uh, sustainability and we're happy to have him. So um, Perrin is going to ask our uh, ask us some questions about our projects. And he also can um, talk about some uh, social sustainability aspects of our project. So we're very happy to have uh, Perrin here. Perrin, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hello. Uh, thanks f so much for inviting me to uh, to have this chat with you too. Um, so I recently graduated from uh, Lund University. Um, I studied environmental studies and sustainability science. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in the uh, design aspects of uh, uh, and applications of design and sustainability. So um, I'm really interested um, in both of your projects because uh, I feel that um, uh, uh, the topic of children in general, uh, they're uh, such an unrecognized uh, group and, and it's really exciting to, to see uh, you two focusing on, uh, on uh, children. So, um, yeah, so we'll just see what happens during the discussion today and uh, and to learn more about both of your projects. Uh, and yeah. Cool. Thank you for uh, joining us. And um, yeah, I wonder if we should uh, just quickly introduce our projects a little bit for a line or two, and then we can sort of have you asking our questions. Is it does it work like that? Do you think? Okay. Uh, so, um, Ivona, do you want to start with talking about your project a little bit? I uh, created um, a project that is called Wire Walkie, which is actually a system of uh, several playful installations that are supposed to be placed on the streets of one neighborhood. And the aim is to encourage children to walk independently, to move around, to explore the neighborhoods and yeah, to create a better community feeling in the neighborhood in general. And um, my project is called The Bookworm, and I created this series of um, uh, modular library spatial product for um, school library mainly, because I think, um, yeah, uh, I want to find a way to motivate and encourage children to uh, read and enjoy the school library environment. And the result is, a, like I said, a modular uh, furniture, a spatial product, as I called it, because children can read in their favorite positions. Uh, also, they can use the furniture to change the spatial setup. So um, yeah, this is my thesis project, mainly about, yeah. Should we uh, talk with a parent? Do you want to ask us some questions that you are curious yeah. about? Uh, yeah, I guess um, just uh, more detailed information uh, yeah. about your project. Um, and I guess, you know, how you include children and mm. uh, just the, the methods that you used uh, during your projects. Um, I don't know which one of you want to talk about your projects first, but uh, yeah, hopefully you can go a bit more into detail into um, um, kind of your, maybe your inspiration for the projects, first of all, and, um, and kind of your design process and inclusion of, of, of children in your projects. Who want to, who want to start? <laughs> you wanna, do you want to start? Uh, I can start, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, of course, uh, uh, the the role of children was very important in my project, but I have to say uh, it was, let's say, 50-50 in creating 50% uh, my uh, uh, own visual um, inspiration or I gave the, the final look, uh, the final, I finalized the idea myself. Uh, but uh, throughout the process, I worked with the children quite a lot. Uh, I made 
uh, three workshops in Gothenburg and uh, several uh, interviews and smaller workshops uh, with children uh, in Berlin. And I actually wanted to see what makes them tick, what, uh, what they find interesting, what they're lacking in their neighborhoods and in, in, in the streets that surround their homes and their schools, how they perceive their way to school, how they actually move around the city, uh, or not the city, but their neighborhood, because I was focusing on neighborhood in my thesis, not uh, the whole city, of course, for eight-year-old children. Uh, the, the neighborhood is more important. So, uh, yeah, I was using quite actually different uh, met methods uh, in this process. So the workshops in Gothenburg were uh, within, within a frame of an elementary school and around 50 children were involved uh, through these three workshops. Um, and then I collected also their works, uh, uh, photos um, of their models and their drawings to find out what they find interesting or what, yeah, how they perceive their streets, uh, if they're safe, dangerous, uh, how they feel in their streets. And also I use sometimes animals and different characters um, to create the narratives, to make them, to encourage them to talk more or express their opinions through other characters, not through themselves always. Uh, so, and with, with the Corona lockdown uh, happening in Berlin um, from March, actually uh, I had to change the methods. Uh, Severely. Uh, so I uh, did a cultural probing with children in Berlin um, where they created a kind of a virtual walking tour in their neighborhood, which I also find very inspiring. Uh, and uh, what else? Uh, yeah, and sadly, because of this whole situation, I couldn't try out the project, the final products uh, or the ideas that I had with the children here in Gothenburg because I created the set of the installations for their neighborhoods. So I really wanted to go around the neighborhood to see how they perceive my ideas, if they like it or not. But this, yeah, this didn't happen, unfortunately. Mm. I am actually quite curious because I have two, I have a very different approach um, to children as, uh, from Ivana. And um, I, I'm actually quite curious about what what's the definition or like, um, what's the difference between cultural probing and other like workshop um, mm -hmm. methods? Well, for, for cultural probing, I yeah. created a set of tasks that I sent out per emails to mm -hmm. their parents. Uh, and then basically they had the tools. Uh, so this cultural probes, uh, the probes, they had the tools uh, with, with which they actually then created the results themselves. Whereas in the workshop, I was there to guide them through the whole process and I was also observing them while they were doing it. So mm -hmm. also timely, it was different. Like the workshops were within this one or two hours, one hour actually mostly. And, uh, and the cultural probing, they can take as much time as they want, which was, but it was around a week or two. Mm. And, and I remember you have like sent out um, like this newsletter or something like that to yeah. the children you work with, right? Yeah, yeah. Good. Do you want to maybe like share a picture of mm -hmm. that? Uh, yeah, I just have to find the picture. Yeah. Okay, so here uh, is the results of, of the walking tour. Uh, I gathered some of the pictures that they sent out, which uh, was yeah, photos taken uh, in Mitte in Berlin, uh, in the neighborhood where the children live and go to school. And you can see here on the left side, um, there was a task for them to draw uh, intervention they would like to see in, uh, in their street through a see-through foil, which was more actually interesting for them because as you can see, it's really hard to capture this well with a photo. Uh, but then you can also see other photos here of things they find interesting, of na uh, photos of nature, photos of, uh, you can see their own uh, self-portraits here and the lower picture and also yeah the trash uh and everything else they observed actually which is realistic uh, view of their neighborhood they're quite honest and direct through this camera mm. so i'm i'm just curious uh um about kind of the feedback that the the children uh gave to you uh throughout this this process um if you can comment on that 
Yeah, there was actually not that many chance for feedback because it was mostly me asking them about the street. Yeah, you, or do you mean the feedback about the streets or about the whole design process? Uh, yeah, just the, um, the, the process, I guess, uh, if they commented yeah. throughout any part of the process. Yeah, okay, so actually what I, what I did also, I compared the experience of children, uh, impressions of children in Gothenburg and in Berlin. And the children in Berlin, of course, had live in a quite a different setting. The streets are much more dense. Uh, there's also much more traffic danger. They're aware of it. That's why they're also practicing it daily. While children in Gothenburg are using the streets that are quite safe, I would say. But on the other hand, quite widespread and not that many um, things or uh, interactive, interesting uh, installations or content on the streets around them, at least around this school that I worked with. So it was quite opposite, actually, I would say, uh, what they perceived as danger. Uh, also, when I asked them, for example, about safety on the streets and danger, the children in Gothenburg uh, were showing me that they want more police or army or people with guns. And I was really oh. surprised well. because <laughs> what they think is safety, and I did not expect that. Mm. And children in Berlin, when they talked about safety, they actually qu felt quite safe. Uh, they were aware of the traffic dangers, of course, but they are quite, uh, I would say, experienced. And um, yeah, they they didn't really lack, they didn't show any signs that they lack. So they felt quite comfortable and confident. Right. right. So uh, it seems that, uh, yeah, through your process that you realize like the importance of context, right? Yeah. Like social and cultural context, the difference in perception of, of safety and, and things like that. And, mm. um, uh does that um i guess in in your design work like uh do you you typically take into account like the unique uh mm -hmm. attributes and aspects of, of who or what you're designing for yes uh, yes and i did especially in this case when i actually decided to do the set of installations it was mostly for a neighborhood that is similar to the one here in Gothenburg that I worked with it was actually on Hisingen so on the other side of the river uh maybe that's also is it seeing your neighborhood no. yeah I live there I not live <laughs> close to the school <laughs> uh -huh. okay. yeah yeah it's also different of course and it's a very developing uh, neighborhood I would say it's changing quite rapidly now but um I know I walked around around the streets that the children also use uh, that they were talking about uh, and then I realized they are actually quite uh, quite empty oh we got a note notification yes <laughs> so yeah the streets uh, were quite empty and really with no content was found there and that actually made also first of all um, the neighbors not gather and not to hang around there and uh, that actually also re really reduces the feeling of safety because it's quite well known that if there's a lot of people and neighbors hanging around, then there's also the crime is much less. Whereas if it's really empty, there's much more chance for a crime to happen. So I, would, I was just planning in my project to create some installations that would just create a content, something playful. So in the end, I realized it doesn't matter even much what exactly it is. They really just need something that they can sit around, hang around, something unusual, something that's unexpected, basically. Maybe you want to show a few pictures of like mm -hmm. the site as well, just to give yeah. a parent an idea. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so here you can see uh, this is first for this is sketches and also locations of uh, where I would like to place those elements. So they are uh, all everyday objects, electrical plugs, but enlarged to a scale around one meter and made of concrete, painted in uh, pale orange, light orange uh, with some uh, blue accents. And um, I thought it would be really cool and interesting maybe for children to just unexpectedly in the middle of nowhere in this empty street to run into a huge electrical plug <laughs> just because they don't expect it. Um, and so this, some of them are also interactive like this one here and the upper um, left corner, which has a, 
a switch that then lights up an installation on the other side of the street or down the street um, yeah, on another location. And yeah, here are some others. One is a little fountain that's also shaped like an electrical socket. Uh, some are also like for a little tram as little trampolines, which are elements that you can find on a playground. But I have to say, this is not a playground. These are playful elements just randomly spread out through the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. And this is the main one. It's actually shaped like a wire and plugged into the ground and actually yeah, in front of the school. So are these design concepts um, that uh, both you and the children uh, created or this is solely from your inspiration? This is, yeah, this is solely from me. That's why okay. I said in the beginning that it was 50-50 yeah, more. I just got input of what they need or want to, how they want to interact with. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the design idea is actually mine. And I wanted to try it out with them. I could just get a short feedback from children in Berlin mm -hmm. because I had contact with them on the sketches. Right, right. Um, and so where do you see your project going from here? Because I think, you know, we, we are all facing this uh, COVID-19 struggle and we mm -hmm. need to, I guess, uh, learn how to adapt. And, um, and I know that, uh, yeah, there were, yeah, from what you mentioned, that there were some, some challenges that you faced because of COVID-19. But how do you see your project going forward? Do you want to continue it or collaborate more with uh, children? Um, the same groups of children? Yeah, uh, I'd like to, of course, but since I moved away from Sweden, uh, I think also it will not be possible maybe in this way, but okay. uh, regarding the development of the, of the whole process and the, and the project, I realized I actually had a chance to, to learn some digital uh, model skills and I can show you actually some uh, okay, yeah, I switched to augmented reality because I realized that's something that can then be used also on a distance, uh, can be used uh, in different locations. So it's not tied, yeah, it's not so complicated in these situations as um, physical objects. And here are the other um, models that I built. Um, actually, for this, uh, for Open Week, for this event, I created some. Uh, filters on Instagram that actually allow everyone to see through their Instagram, for those who have Instagram, um, to see those models also on a smaller scale in the, in the space because you need a photo which activates to see those filters and then to see them in kind of 3D, in augmented reality, basically. Very cool. <laughs> Can I ask a question as well? I think uh like i i would have i don't know um i think i would like to hear uh, what you think about when you compare like um these two groups of children like one in one group in gothenburg and one group in berlin like what was the intention and first of all and also like um do you think your installation is um, universal in a way that can be applied also in Berlin since you designed it for mm -hmm. the Gothenburg context. Yeah, uh, I think uh, in this way, not really. I think also Berlin is already overloaded with content in the streets anyway, they wouldn't just fit there. But I think there's a lot of other, street, uh, other yeah, streets, other uh, cities that could accommodate it. And uh, it depends. It, 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 it's not only it's not a project that can only be set in Gothenburg but it's definitely requires a certain set of requirements <laughs> yeah but also the first question was how uh -huh. do you think like uh, why did you choose to compare or to work with these two groups of children one in because in Berlin? yeah because I, uh, I I live there I live in Berlin and I was curious also to see uh, how what is the situation like somewhere else in Europe or somewhere where I could also uh, reach and where I actually have contacts with, uh, so that I can see if this is this the only reality or like, <laughs> because I know it's not everywhere like it is in Gothenburg. And for sure there's even much more different situations somewhere else. But uh, I wanted to not have only one 
uh, viewpoint yeah. to this. Yeah. To be honest, I find um, what you said, the, um, the perception of safety uh, or street safety from uh, Gothenburg children, like children in Berlin is quite different. And I find it very fascinating because I think when you talk with children and they say they come up with the idea of like army and yeah. soldiers, I think I think for me, right, I, I'm just talking about my own opinion here, but like personally, I think it is very, um, it's a huge sign of the, uh, of um, a, a fact that they trust their environment, like they wouldn't think of um, small things that matters to their like everyday life, like they wouldn't think that uh, we need more uh, traffic control or traffic lights, they, they only think like something something big, like something that maybe the uh, media would picture to them. Yeah. Like, as a symbol of safety instead of mm. like uh we need we need maybe more zebra lines and we need more you know um traffic police or something and i don't mm. know like i think although like it's very very different from two mm. groups of children but it is quite interesting to yeah mm. at least that's my understanding from the result i don't know if that's correct or not but. yeah no you're right and i think that children also often like first of all maybe it was the language, uh, it was in English, so maybe for them, the word safety was only related to the, to the safety uh, with, I don't know, police, uh, crime mm -hmm. safety, and not the street safety mm -hmm. as traffic. Um, but also, children in Berlin, I have to say, were very also aware in the same way what, for example, media was saying, because they were, um, they mentioned to me, uh, yeah, they feel really safe and confident. They don't, they're not afraid of traffic. But, you know, they told me then about uh, a family uh, or two children that actually died a year ago in a car crash. Um, they were pedestrians. So they were really aware, of very, you know, about their surrounding and what's going on. Mm. Yeah. And I, and I want to ask a slightly more challenging question to you as well. Like, I, I totally see the point of you wanting to, like, add the playfulness to the street. And I think mm -hmm. it is very important in um, children's everyday life. And, um, and I'm also thinking, does it also add to this risk of, um, you know, the safety issue mm -hmm. when they are walking the street? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, uh, of course, there's always there was always a slight uh, chance of, of risk and, and mm -hmm. children injuring themselves even in the playground. But uh, that's why I was also thinking that uh, these installations should not be placed so th in, a, in a really dangerous manner and like not really near the crossing or not too close to the street, still near the sidewalk, but not really blocking the way or making it too high to climb, for example. Um, but on the other hand, same like with children in Berlin, it was, it shows, and also a lot of researches actually show, it's very important that children do walk and experience the traffic daily, even if it means basic, basically being exposed more to it, uh, which of course increases the risk, but there's no other way to gain the traffic skills, uh, only with, yeah. with practicing it every day. Mm. So I'm I'm a bit curious just to uh, elaborate on that point. Um, uh, it, the issue of uh, children's safety in the streets and uh, traffic. Um, do you see the role of maybe your project as children, maybe, um, I don't know, having the ability to reclaim space uh, in a sense um, by, you know, having these kind of installation, these playful spaces, because um, uh, you describe the children, uh, they, uh, they're very aware of kind of the place themselves and I think oftentimes as an adult you you think that you know we we know much more than the children we're much more aware of our surroundings but it seems that the children they're very aware of of, of their space themselves mm -hmm. so um, how important do you think that uh, you know this your type of project is good for like children claiming space mm -hmm. in the city yeah um yeah so i am quite aware that the children would have a lot more or fully sense of ownership if they were involved uh in the in the final process until the end but it was actually really abruptly stopped because of the whole situation and uh, even though the schools were open the university closed the doors and um physically it was not really so easy to go into school and just approach children 
uh, I would like to, of course, know what they what they think uh, if they find uh, if they actually see any um, if they see any feeling of this uh, elements or uh, my ideas belonging well or fitting well in their neighborhood. Um, but yeah, as I said, like uh, unless unless you work with the participants um, or the users until the end. Uh, they would probably not have the full sense of ownership, but still, mm -hmm. I cannot say how they would feel because I didn't try it all. Uh, I didn't try it out in the end with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, are you able to pro provide, a, I guess, a bit more background um, into your project? Uh, mm -hmm. I guess you know why traffic. Um, mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I, found, I find the, the topic of children in the city in general very inspiring and I knew that this would be somehow my area because that's also where I grew up and I always felt the sense of belonging like my natural environment and I was curious also to find uh, how and why uh, are there so many traffic accidents happening especially with children because I just don't see why this should be still an issue in 2020, but it is, it's quite actually, not in Gothenburg though, and not in Scandinavian countries as much as in Germany or in Croatia where I come from, uh, where, where there's yeah, quite some number of accidents still happening in the traffic and ch involving children. And I then came through the research uh, to, um, through the to the statistics that actually show that children are often lately in the last 20 30 years not as much as involved as before uh, in the traffic so they're always uh, or not always but often brought to school by their parents uh, all the way until they're 11 or 12 years old which i find really strange because we were always walking to school and then we this is the way to to gain the skills to gain the traffic skills and then also later become um, a pedestrian that also feels and acts maybe much safer in traffic. But as the trend of children not walking so often in the last 20 years has grown, I wanted to explore this topic and that that's actually how it, I got to this uh, installations in these streets. Okay, very cool. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, thanks so much, uh, Ivana. Um, it was great learning uh, more about your project, and um, and it sounds really, really promising. And I hope that you keep uh, working and continuing on it. Um, but uh, yeah, Shinny, I guess uh, it's it's your turn. Uh, yeah, it's my uh, turn. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm really curious to yeah. um, uh, know about the one the inspiration. Of, mm. of your project, why you decided to, that topic area, and mm. and uh, I guess yeah, go more into depth about your project. Yeah, if you can. definitely. Um, I'm actually uh, in the very very beginning when we were trying to like explore the um, ter research territory where we want to go into. I actually wanted to um, work with public libraries because I think I always have this complex with library, and I wanted sort of um, explore more in the idea of how children can be better, um, can be more comfortable in the library, basically. That's what I, uh, my first thought. And then uh, when I was like having interviews with librarians and I discovered that actually the school library is a very interesting context to work with. First of all, like, um, like some some public libraries or like big main public libraries of a city they normally are like designed by a you know a super uh big or like well-known um architecture firm to make it like sort of like a landmark or something and also like the city focuses on um public li libraries more and more as they want to develop this cultural aspect of it but the school libraries normally like um they um, I don't know how it is in the, I don't know, other contexts or other cities, but uh, so in, in some cases, the school libraries is just like a vacant, you know, empty room that's not, they don't know how to use it. And they were like, okay, let's put some shelves in it and let's make it a school library. And it's normally not very um, 
thought through decision and they didn't know like how to make it a uh, some schools i would say like don't know how to make it a cozy place for students to um, actually read or like study so um after i figured i discovered this and i think to myself yeah i want to like maybe shift my direction a bit more to the school library also like that's where um the cho children really uses the space as not as students anymore they choose freely what they want to read and they do basically what they want to do in the space as long as they follow the rules so i think they have a sort of like different rules as roles as well like in when they're in the school library and i sort of wanted to like this uh, just sort of explore this a bit more so i chose it as um yeah my thesis idea great yeah. excellent <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, yes, if you can just uh, tell mm -hmm. us more about uh, your, your project itself, uh, Bookworm. Yeah. And, uh... yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah I, so after, after I sort of decided to work with school libraries and I um, started to reaching out to schools because you can't just um, design for a very idealistic site because that's not how it works. And especially when you want to design with children, I think you actually have to find a place where you can focus and you it has to be very contextualized. So um, I was sending out, to e uh, sending out emails to schools in Gothenburg and I got reply from um, ISGR, the International School of Gothenburg Region. And um, they are very open-minded and they like invited me to visit their libraries. And um, I got to like sort of stay a little uh, in the library sessions where they have like reading classes. So I was in the library and like it just uh, first of all started to um, just to observe what children are doing and and then I just and then that's how like I sort of started the journey of um, involving children or approaching children in um, that specific context. And um, yeah, like one main method I used was um, observation in the beginning. Like I wanted to see how they interact with the whole space, like how they use the shelves, how they um, use the library furniture, and how they move around in the whole place. And I actually have a picture with, where I um, made a sort of a mark the end of uh, my, not the end, but like mark uh, my, just to summarize my observation, I think I have it here. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. Um, so I've in the beginning, um, when I when I sort of uh, yeah observed the situation and I made like. Um, uh, just like a drawing or like a model of the whole space and I marked like um, yeah this is the office this is the entrance like um, how do they where do they normally read and um, and I also investigated specifically on how they interact with the furniture there and um, I tried to go to the next page and I realized that they have so many different ways of using the um, furniture for example um, I tried to compare different uh, reading habits. I m first mapped my own pro uh, my own postures when I am reading at home. Like you can see, I um, like how maybe when I'm, uh, for example, reading at the dining table, I would definitely try to like put my foot, or my feet on the um, chair on the opposite side. <laughs> or I like, um, yeah, I, I probably would lie down to read and I was, and I would probably just sit on the floor. And then in the school library, which is the following two pictures, I figured out that um, they're like using, sometimes they use the sofa as a sort of like a reading surface and they would, not use the sofa in a in a way that we imagine that we use, and also they will probably like kneel uh, on a on a chair and then they read together on the like the chair handle. Um, yeah, so I is a chair handle, not like a hand armrest, right? Yeah, that's the word, and it's just like yeah, very different from what I imagine, and it's definitely very uh, different from what pick what people uh, who bought the. Uh, furniture in the very beginning imagine they would use it so um they sort of set um a direction for me to go so like um yeah i want to i want to make a furniture that actually accommodates their uh 
their need for a, a library furniture. Like they that provides them a better support to read in their favorite um, positions, basically. And yeah, so this is sort of like a um, the first. I'm gonna start sharing now. And this is like the first step of what I did. And then after that, I had a like very. I got this opportunity of working with a design class. Um, and uh, in that course, the children basically have to sort of look for um, the school furniture, a piece of school furniture, and they sort of have to like um, judge or make um, a, make assessment of uh, how this furniture should uh, is. For example, based on this format function, so um, it's, it was the main idea of the. Uh, design course and then I decided uh, and I got this opportunity to like work with them and I uh, sort of used it as well like um, I invited children to work with um, I encouraged them I not everyone's working with school libraries I encouraged them to choose a piece of school library uh, furniture and then I would ask them um, how do you want to change it or how do you want to redesign it to make something that you want to read and or make something that you want to use basically so um yeah so um after i got a lot of information of course during the um during the workshop it was a very intense two week workshop children have to um come up with they, they have to criticize basically one specific piece of furniture and then they have to um come up with their own design ideas and they have um i actually bought a lot of covers and i have and i um cut out a lot of wooden sticks like probably this long like different lenses um very small thin wood sticks for them to just make a one-on-one -on -one scale um prototype on their own <laughs> So yeah, it was a very intense process. And um, after that, I sort of um, knew the direction of what I want to go because uh, they sort of expressed what, what their uh, preference on uh, library furniture basically. And then that's how I started my design process. And that's when I started to take initiative on the um, project as a designer. But that's how I approached Chojin yeah, in a, that's a very long answer, and I don't know <laughs> if you uh, can get it or not, yeah. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, the children, they're uh, very central to, uh, I guess, the, the design of uh, your, your final, final product. Mm. Um, are you able to give a bit more, like, uh, examples of um, some of, um, I don't know, the input that the, yeah. the, the children gave? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures as well. So this is um, basically what I get, but it's like um, different types of uh, input that I get from children. Um, for example, I got like, I don't, I'm going to zoom in on this. Yeah, I get pictures like this where children like read. Uh, yeah, uh, on I, I asked them to take before and after pictures of what they what they uh, built. So for example, this first picture is about um, children who want to like have books or like have their own belongings around them. So they want to like have, keep everything close so that they ha don't have to get up and <laughs> reach for them. And uh, this one is, uh, as well, like um, this kid, he doesn't really, uh, he wanted to make something that's Sort of interacting with the sofa and he want to uh, have support when he put all uh, his legs full folded his legs on the chair and this is for his leg support basically <laughs> and, um, and the original idea i remember of this uh, student project is that he wanted to um, have books that's just um, uh, below the chair so that he can sit on a pile of uh, books and read Mm -hmm. And I found that, that um, relationship between this prototype and books very fascinating. Also, um, there are children who want to like build um, a stool for like a corner where she can read just um, nearby the shelves. And yeah, like these are the one of the main results I get, which is um, pictures. I have 19 groups of children and each group have uh, had um, two students and um, yeah, and 19. Um, projects on the library furniture, and also I have like 
as you can see on the right, we have student writings about their project ideas. Basically, they have to justify or articulate their uh, project ideas. For example, why do I why did I choose this specific piece of furniture, and what did I do to make it a better furniture than it was? So um, this is what I've got, and maybe I can just quickly show how I analyze the data as well, and to combine all my findings, like uh, my. Also, I have, you know, discussions with them about what's their favorite furniture and what they wanted to, wanted to have in the school library. And uh, together with the writings, I category, I, I made five categories, for example, uh, categories, um, for example, the subject, like what um, furniture they chose to redesign or add on or, and the attributes to their um, prototype and the feelings that they wanted to create or that they wanted to have. Um, also the actions, what they do, uh, what to do with in the, uh, with the project uh, prototype. Also there are critiques on the current um, environment. So that's what I've got. And then in the end, I have, I, um, I have these feelings and actions, which I found very um, useful to my design ideas because they would mention that the feelings I want the school libraries to have is to um, be a very calming place to be, um, to make you feel like peaceful. And also you have to like feel happy, feel good in this uh, environment. Also the actions they, uh, often mentioned is that uh, they want to lie down <laughs> in the furniture, they want to read in the sleeping position, <laughs> and they want to curl up, and they want to have their things around them. So I took these um, basically um, keywords into consideration when I started to design um, a piece, uh, the series of furniture. Yeah, I am going to stop right now. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess uh, the final product that mm. you designed, um, mm. uh, I don't know, do you have any comments on that? I noticed that, you know, the, mm. the name of your project is called Bookworm. Mm. So uh, <laughs> I guess it's Worm it, it's inspired, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, it's not, um, it's not, uh, yeah. I don't know if you say a uh, warm inspired, but it's more like I have this shape first, and then I um, I found the word book warm is really uh, suitable for the shape. I was I was just like sort of um, when I was designing, I had the idea of um, like modular system because I think uh, one thing that I wanted them to do is to that um, is uh, to customize their surroundings and to customize their own um, furniture. So that's something that I want to uh, have in my uh, furniture, which is this uh, customizability. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, and um, and I was ju just basically uh, doing sketches about it. And uh, I, I found that uh, this sort of one stroke uh, line very, um, fascinating in a way because uh, one single line can accommodate, accommodate so many different postures mm -hmm. and I sort of yeah and I wanted to go into that a bit more and I created a series that's based on this one stroke mm -hmm. um, piece so um, yeah and then I, later when I was thinking of the name and I found oh bookworm yeah <laughs> isn't it suitable for uh, my design you know so yeah that's how um, I named <laughs> Uh, my uh, project yeah nice. mm. um ivana do you have any questions for yeah. mm. i was writing them down oh wow <laughs> <laughs> no i don't have that many this is not another scissors debate you know <laughs> i feel like it is <laughs> uh, getting some deja vus no but uh, i have for now two questions uh maybe i get more later yeah but uh, i was wondering uh like I know you didn't work just with children, you also worked mm -hmm. with other stakeholders mm -hmm. or can you tell more about that process also like for your other um, user targeted groups except for children? And like how, how I worked with them or? Yeah, yeah. I was actually aiming for the librarians and other mm -hmm. uh, staff that maybe mm -hmm. helped you facilitate uh, yeah. the workshops and 
project? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I have a lot, uh, I think I, I got a lot of input from librarians at the um, workshop in the beginning, like how I um, used, how they uh, used the um, library, for example, like, um, I, I got to know that they would have staff meeting, like the teachers meeting in the library as well. And I also got to know that, like, um, yeah, like how children, uh, how children would use the library furniture. Like we can go back to the first um, picture that I showed you, because that's a very interesting finding. And I didn't really share about it. Um, Yeah, so um, we can see like in, oh, sorry. Yeah, we can see in this um, mapping of the library space, I got to know that it's very interesting. Maybe you can make a guess, both of you, to guess which is the least favorite or like least popular um, furniture that children decided to use. In the furniture? Library. Yeah, the furniture. For example, um, you have, this is A, this is B, this is uh, C and this is D. Which one is the least popular? The table? Um, yeah, I would say table because children, they table? sit at tables all day long. Or this. This one. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, this is the least favorite, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I asked the librarian where is the least um, popular area and she said, yeah, this table is very often unused. <laughs> <by> <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, I got this information um, from a librarian and I um, and I think one thing that I now think would be like I would have I should have done is that I should have maybe um, worked with uh, the teachers or the staff a bit more because I was my focus was actually solely on children because they are I saw them as a main users. My next question actually was uh, related to, to also the changes that uh, happened yeah. uh, from March on. Can you say also how, and how did you, did you even have a chance uh, to also like me had get the feedback from the children of your products? And yeah. How did you go about that? Yeah, one thing that's very, very sad, uh, oh, not very sad, but like um, one thing that I did recently is that I invited um, or I wrote this little story um, about my project and I, and I um, asked the librarian that I worked with to post it on the, on the library blog. So, and I left my um, contact information there as well. I think that was like sort of one way for me to approach them because before maybe I wanted to sort of have a more um, personal engagement with them, maybe to visit the school one more time or yeah, um, and to talk to them in person, but I think it is quite hard to do right now. Um, um, yeah, but I mean, and I also wrote to librarians and I showed them my website or how I used, how I used the information that I got from children and how I came up with my own ideas. And I um, also pre sort of presented them in a way um, in my website. So um, this is another thing I did. Uh, one thing that I, that I said was very sad <laughs> about this <laughs> was that um, um, I, had a, I had a student from who I worked with in the, um, in the school. Uh, she could, uh, she was interested in joining our off, uh, offline um, activity, but because of you know, um, what happened and it got canceled and I was not able to meet her in person, which I think was quite sad. And uh, mm. yeah, but yeah, I mean, I hope that maybe she's watching this video and she can, you know, um, and I, I want to encourage students that I worked with to reach out to me and we can still keep the conversation open. Yeah. That's nice. That's very nice. <laughs> so can I just then uh, use parents uh, question to me and <laughs> throw it back to you and I was, I'm just wondering how are you planning to continue uh, yeah. developing like because you just mentioned it, that that's one way maybe but do you have some other further plans for further uh, development of the project yeah uh, I think 
I think for me right now, I would really want to listen to some, you know, professional suggestions. And I would really want to sort of pitch my ideas to companies who work with probably um, school furniture or companies that knows this market to have more feedback on my project. Because I know that uh, maybe it looks okay, that it looks in sort of different from all the other um, uh, furnitures on the market but like when it comes to transportation or when it comes to you know actually the manufacturer process that uh, does it work I don't know like that's just my concept and I really want to find a way to make it um, sort of bridge the gap between the co uh, concept and a uh, built um, project yeah mm -hmm. and that's what that will be my focus I guess in the mm -hmm. near future at least mm. Good. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe it's uh, time to um, switch gears. Yeah. And, uh, I think mm -hmm. uh, personally, you know, yeah. um, I have a sustainability background. Yeah. And, um, and I feel, you know, it's sustainability is a, a presence. Uh, mm -hmm. ever present issue in our everyday lives and um, you see it everywhere and um, I'm, I'm really curious about um, um, not only just about your projects and how you um, incorporate uh, sustainability or if you consider it but yeah how do you perceive sustainability um, in general and I, I think uh, that's uh, this question is for both uh, Yushini and uh, Ivana mm -hmm. um, and uh, do you try to integrate uh, sustainability at all um, into your design processes or um, into, um, I guess, you know, your ultimate creation, whatever you're trying to help create? Mm. Uh, I think, I think for me, or at least uh, I think uh, what we um, did in the very beginning of our project is to identify which uh, which um, SDG as uh, sustainable development goals we are mostly like identified with. For example, I, I think probably like here Yvonne and Nice um, main focus is the same. I think it's article what, 11 or 12, like this is an inclusive city. And for me, I think I, I address this issue as well with the children I worked with that um, I wanted to, in, to encourage, encourage them to think about a furniture that promotes inclusive, inclusive inclusivity, inclusive, eh? inclusive. <laughs> I forgot the word. Um, yeah, to uh, to promote this idea of um, inclusive uh, in their in their work, and I think this is something that I would that I at least communicated with children and. Um, and also, I think for me, sustainability also lies in the aspect of like having children in the design process. I think itself is quite is more or less a sustainable move in a design process. And I think like it's also very important for like companies to do the same as well as you know the um, conventional children's rights have become a law in um, Sweden since uh, in 2020 this year. And um, I think it's like calling for companies and organizations to include um, children in the in their design process. And I think it's a very it's another like aspect of sustainability because I think when sometimes when I think people think about sustainability, they think about um, the material we use, and I think it it would be more than that. Yeah, and I'm curious of what you wanna say as well, Ivana. Uh, so yeah, uh, definitely I agree uh, with you on this, uh, that uh, of course uh, a lot of other goals are probably also in the back of our minds, but I think yeah, we did both mostly focus on, on the 11th one. Uh, yeah, and um, I really try to think in which ways I could make the street, uh, the sidewalks, uh, the neighborhood streets, make more inclusive, safe, resilient, sustainable. But that, of course, is not only for children. And throughout the project, I was always also having in mind all the uh, residents uh, and just passerbys or 
um, people who own businesses on those streets because they're all uh, quite important stakeholders of the street and they also together create the community and the safety feeling and, and actual safety on the streets. Uh, I don't mean traffic safety, I mean uh, uh, the safety, yeah, safe feeling. Um, but also, yeah, for me, sustainability was quite important uh, as an aspect. Maybe I wasn't so obvious in it, but uh, in general, walking uh, versus uh, driving a car is already, uh, I think, a big step towards a more sustainable life and also in the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also, it encouraged me to uh, encourage me to encourage children to become the more to live more sustainably in their neighborhood to grow up also as uh, responsible citizens who will reduce using of cars and the air pollution and uh, use bikes uh, have habits of walking that's that was actually quite an important uh, aspect of in my project mm -hmm. um so for for both of you i guess uh um the participatory aspect um was very important to uh your, your projects uh, participating having the children participate in the design process um is is that um, um is that common within design uh, i guess to um i guess whomever you're designing for uh, to have this uh, collaborative participatory process uh, that allows, you know, not only just the, um, you know, the designer's view of, of what it should be, but also um, the, the, the individuals who will be using or affected by whatever you're, you're creating. I don't think that's very common in the current design practice, right, Ivana? I would say I, I'm not so familiar uh, because my background was more in the art field. So what, yeah. what I've seen, it's, it mm -hmm. is uh, more common here in Sweden, definitely, than, for example, in Germany. And this inter interdisciplinary approach and uh, holistic approach in design, I think, is maybe a bit more innovative here in Sweden or in Scandinavian countries. This is what it seems to me. Yeah, uh, because I think participatory design or like user-centric design, um, started in an interaction design, as, at least that's what I read. Um, and yeah, I think I think tr um, having a participatory design practice in the place making with children and like or community ba community building uh, with children is definitely something quite um, unique in a way, because first of all, like children is being the ones that are always excluded by design process also um yeah i think that um the, the field of um community building or as we say and um, place making is often uh something that's a very top-down process by which i mean like the government or maybe the design firms they make the decision instead of creating something with the community or with the users together so i think um this is and also, yeah, because of these, the combination of children's particip participation and community building with children is very, um, it's not something that's common yet, but I hope to see like more and more um, organizations or companies that start to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm finding that uh, um, in sustainability in general, like, um, uh, yeah, participation is a very key aspect mm -hmm. um, because, you know, uh, in kind of shaping the world, well, trying to address the, the sustainability problems, um, there are a wide range of, you know, stakeholders who are affected, individuals, environments, and things like that. And um, usually there are kind of a, a select few who have the power in uh, deciding who participates and yeah. uh, things like that. And often, um, you know, children, they're rarely even mentioned in uh, this, this process. And uh, personally, I find uh, the participatory processes um, yeah, very in important because, you know, um, in trying to envision this uh this new world there are so many people um who will be involved in this future and um 
I, I find it very important that, you know, children are included in this process. So um, I'm curious, uh, you know, with your interactions with children, mm -hmm. what kind of uh, surprised you or, or shocked you, um, you know, in, uh, you know, maybe their ideas or, 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 or things like that, that you find are relevant for addressing uh, some of our future problems? Hmm. That's a good question. I think yeah. um, I I think one thing that definitely surprised me is that um, I never realized how young children um, start to concern the um, sustainability sustainability goals and sustainability issues. I don't know if it's like a single case or it's uh, it's the same everywhere else in Sweden that um, in the uni uh, in the school that I worked with I worked with children that's in um, year five which was around you know 11 or 13 11 or 12 maybe and um, I was surprised that uh, one of the one of the student they made uh, one of the student groups they made um, these boxes for uh, books and um, and the category of the books should be um, should be one of the sustainability goal because I remember like they made this little card that says um, life on land and life in the sea and um, they said we're going to put these relevant books in this box for the life or that's like related to life on the land or life in the sea which I think is really surprising to me because I never realized that they first of all they knew the sustainability goal or like um, they are they seem to be very willing to promote the idea or to um, yeah to to sort of address this issue basically in their design project so yeah I, I think that's a very promising sign as well for me mm -hmm. to like sort of communicate my future practice with the younger generation that I'm doing um, uh, article 11 in SDGs and they would immediately understand what that is and that's mm -hmm. quite yeah, fascinating to imagine, I think. Yeah. What about you? What about you, Ivana? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't have uh, this experience. I actually didn't talk uh, to children about the sustainability goals, but I was quite surprised um, about their, I mean, I knew they had, of course, different perception of, of the time and space uh, than, uh, we as adults have but I was also really surprised about their uh, knowing of technology of like uh, they, they had very interactive and quite advanced ideas of what they wanted in their neighborhood like um, and they and then when I asked them that how would with this and this work uh, like um, uh, lights on the playground like would it be then lighting all night for who and then they were like no it has a timer and it, they already thought out through everything uh, into details and um, and another thing actually that also um, really, um, yeah, was a bit new for me was I forgot how time uh, is, this is not so much uh, relevant for sustainability, but it is uh, something I wanted to mention because um, for example, for them, the time is a big problem when they're walking around, they, they forget about the time. They don't have the same feeling of time like we adults have because they don't have mobile phones yet. For example, this was eight year old. And so I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of things uh, that why we need to have children's input is because we forget about some things we take for granted. Of course, you know what time it is. You either have a watch or you have a phone with you. But uh, for children, some things are not so obvious. And I'm sure this is just one example with children, but uh, there's for sure a lot of other things we just tend to forget because we take them for granted. So this is why participation is really very important when it comes to public spaces and uh, neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah I think, I think um, also it's not that we take it, maybe it's not only that we take it for granted, but also like we as adults, we forgot how we felt yeah. when we were kids. So that's sort of addresses that uh, the importance of listening to the um, children because they are expert, experts in what they, um, yeah, their surrounding and their own lives. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I feel as though it's uh, important for children to be included in these processes um, 
to you know one have a platform to express their their own voice um, because they do have needs they do have preferences and um, and yeah they do have their own minds and often adults kind of dictate you know what children do but um, uh, I think uh, you know creating this um, sense of ability to to change and to influence and kind of uh, shape the world in some way for children. I think it's a very important component and aspect uh, and, and perhaps their development. Um, and, and also uh, because they'll be our, our future leaders and uh, decision makers. So this practice of exercising, uh, and sharing their own ideas um, and, and collaborating, uh, I think that's so, so relevant, so important. I have a question for you, Perrin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> as, some, uh, as, a, as someone who studies sustainability, and yeah. I want to know what you think is sustainability and how you um, see the relationship of our projects with sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, probably the point that I, I touched on is uh, this participation element, but I think, uh, um, and I, I thought that you two brought like very important issues such as like contextuality um, and uh, Ivana, you, you did both Gothenburg and Berlin cases and you, you could see the, the different perceptions of, uh, of, of safety, just, you know, very simple aspects of, of daily life that, you know, we kind of, uh, we, we take for granted or we don't recognize, um, I think, uh, in societies today, we still have this tendency to generalize uh, all the problems, all the people, and um, whereas each place, each group has very specific um, um, challenges that need to be addressed. And I thought, uh, yeah, Ivana, because you did kind of the two cases, you're able to highlight some of those, you know, very big uh, cultural differences, cultural needs, or uh, spatial needs and, and differences. Um, and um, I think that's one of many <laughs> challenges that, that need to be uh, addressed and, and looked at uh, within sustainability. So um, I think uh, personally, uh, I had uh, a closer um, um, interest with uh, the social aspects of, of sustainability. Um, and uh, I think um, I mentioned to you that this participatory element is, uh, I find very important because, um, yeah, inclusion in, um, I guess, creation and design and, and problem solving is, is very important. Uh, and um, I, I, I find that, you know, with Shinny, you wanted to include more stakeholders into uh, into your your project, but I guess because of time constraints, um, uh, you weren't able to. But I think you like design has this kind of uh, um, this element of of collaboration, uh, like inherent in in the in the discipline. And I, I think, yeah, to like with sustainability, like interdisciplinarity. Um, working with different stakeholders and coming together with new ideas to address problems uh, is, is very important. So, um, yeah, I find that I, I really find uh, participation a very important aspect of uh, sustainability. Um, but it's, you know, one of the many ways that we can address uh, some of the challenges. So. Nice. I think we're going to um, wrapping up our discussion here. And I wonder, like, um, does anyone have something to say in the end? <laughs> um, Ivana, do you have like anything to um, say to our audience since our um, activity is canceled? And mm -hmm. I wonder what you want to say about it. Yeah, um, well, I, I think we were both actually looking forward to uh, 
to also use this workshop that was supposed to happen today also as a way to wrap up our thesis that we also didn't actually finish uh, in a physical sense like especially with children so this was uh, this could have been a way for us to uh, meet with the children once again especially with the children here the children maybe we worked with but uh, also i just wanted to um, I wanted us to like briefly mention what was the plan for the workshops uh, because we were supposed to have two parallel workshops in the same space then uh, children could uh, maybe be a part of one group and then later switch to the other and um, yeah we were actually planning to work with paper and cardboard um, also an important thing is that i think was to yeah use this material that are quite simple but they also allow quite a lot of creativity for children and also can be used fully so my idea was also to not have any leftovers of paper but to really just use all the material in order to create some uh, models of street design furniture playful installations um something like that so, well thing you had a, a bit different material right uh, I think I think uh, material wise, I I chose to work with like cupboards and um, and I was thinking of um, clay as well. Sort of, I I want to invite children to um, build their sort of ideal uh, reading environment with um, materials provided, uh, cupboards and like some uh, colored papers, clays, like pen, um, colored pencils and stuff to, yeah, to um, basically it's sort of like, um, like a mini version, mini version of uh, what I did with children in two, two weeks. But um, yeah, I wanted to sort of recreate this scenario so people have, uh, can get an idea of what I did. But yeah, it's very sad that um, we couldn't um, have this activity today. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's, mm. it's understandable. Um, mm. Just uh, one more thing uh, that I prepared for the workshop that I wanted to share with you <laughs> is uh, I actually find narratives uh, very important, especially as triggers uh, mm -hmm. in the workshops with children. And as I said, like before, I worked uh, with uh, animal characters uh, for the first workshop here, and I. I think that was that gave quite good results because then children could uh, see, look at their streets, the same streets that they know, but through the eyes of a different creatures that move with four legs and uh, that are a bit different than they are. So they can think also in a bit abstract ways and have some more fun and more abstract ideas. But for this uh, for this workshop, I actually I made little clay characters. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. <laughs> <laughs> which I baked especially yeah. to encourage children to to you know ha to think how how are the other how could the other Im imaginary creatures use their streets and walk uh, and sit down and move along the streets and um, yeah just to kind of broaden their perspectives on the streets uh, and it's also very important for children's imagination but perhaps you also wanted to show your model uh, during this workshop, am I right? Singing? Um, actually, not. I I was planning to show some illustrations and uh -huh. yeah, maybe more of a process picture. But I have um, students um, projects, some of them with me in the space. So I wanted to actually have them around with me while I'm I, while I um, had this talk. But yeah. Um, I think I'm gonna like put some maybe pictures of the. Um, mm -hmm models that I brought into the venue here on a talk so people ha can get an idea of yeah what that is but um, I wanted the final words I want to say to wrap up our um, little talk is that um, yeah, although our um, on-site activities canceled unfortunately but I still want to like address it one more time that I that we very want to just keep our discussion open to like our audience and I would really like to have them maybe um, send email to us to you know to follow up this conversation and um, if you have like any questions and that any more interest in our project and also like um, if you want to talk more with parents uh, maybe just um, yeah send us emails and let's just keep 
our discussion open in a way. And yeah, yeah I'm gonna try to put some, um, I don't know, email address on our video so people can reach out mm -hmm. to us if they want. For comments yeah. and questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can but, I just add? Sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. Ivana. Uh, uh, because I wanted to present in the space also some digital models, that's not possible now, but uh, they can be also um, found on, on my Instagram account with the use of a photo that they have to print out because it's only triggered, this augmented reality um, filters are triggered only with a post, poster or a picture that I'm going to post there. So perhaps if someone is interested, they can check out my Instagram account. Yeah, which I'll put on the video. Yes. <laughs> 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 I was hoping for that. <laughs> All right. Um, Perrin, you have anything to add? Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, we are happy to have you here. <laughs> oh, thank wow. you. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's such a huge pleasure to, uh, to, to have this chat with, um, yeah, with the both of you and to learn more about your projects. And um, yeah, and I wish the best of luck for you too in uh, you so your design future or your artistic future. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. All right. So I guess now I have to say goodbye to our audience. Let's wave together. <laughs> <laughs>